is very unique. It was born out of five established communities. They were just little farming communities. They came together and, and incorporated as a city. And at the time that that happened, the, the total population of the five was about 20,000. It grew fast and it grew mostly residentially. In 50 years, Fremont, like many parts of the U.S., has been transformed by new immigration. Fremont has a long-standing Latino presence, dating back to the late 1700s when Spanish missions were established near Ohlone villages. By 1956, when the city incorporated, the population was predominantly white. Within the next decade, the new Immigration and Nationalities Act would bring dramatic changes to the U.S., and in the decades that followed, would transform this city. Starting in the 80s, we all of a sudden transitioned into a city of great diversity. There were incidents, there were things that shouldn't have happened. But by and large, it happened uh, in, a, in a very smooth way. We have people from over 147 countries with 157, 54 different languages spoken at home. In the 1980s, the Silicon Valley was booming, bringing new technologies, new businesses, and new citizens to Fremont. Today, Fremont's majority ethnic group is Asian. The churches of Fremont now reflect the global dimensions of the Christian faith. Here, the Lord's Prayer is spoken in many languages, Spanish and Burmese, Telugu and Cantonese, Farsi and Mandarin. At the same time, new religious traditions have become part of Fremont's religious landscape. We have a large Sikh population. We also have a large Hindu population, which has a temple at the other end of the community. We have the largest Afghan population of any city in the United States. We have four mosques in our community. We have a Thai Buddhist temple. In addition to the Thai temple, a ranch house serves as a women's monastic center. A Chinese Buddhist temple blends into the Silicon Valley landscape and two Burmese Buddhist monasteries have been developed, including Metananda Vihara, visible from busy Central Avenue. On many Fremont streets, there are vivid signs of change, from Gurdwara Road to Peace Terrace. I studied world religions in my first or second year in college. Little did I know. <laughs> I should have read that book <laughs> more closely. Fremont uh, is a showcase because of our multicultural backgrounds of so many people. I think Fremont's diversity is one of its, uh, you know, one of its things to brag about. The dramatic transformation of Fremont's religious landscape began in the 1980s, when Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh communities first established places of worship. These buildings affirmed in brick and mortar a sense of permanence. Fremont's new religious neighbors were here to stay. And when the Fremont Hindu Temple first started, um, it started because it moved into a church. Over the years, we began to recognize that a temple should look like a temple, making the uh, courtyard uh, look like a temple courtyard. We began this amazing effort of sensitizing the neighborhood and recognizing that going into the neighborhoods and talking to them and reaching out to them created all the difference. There are many people who felt that building this temple was probably the most important thing. In my mind and those of many of my generation believe that the creation of temple was just the beginning. Buying a structure and building a temple, getting the necessary permits is just okay. You follow building codes and approvals, it's easy. I think the acceptance begins after that. When the Hindu people first, um, they bought property to build the temple, 
and it was in a residential area. There was a lot of resistance from the residents. I was police chief at the time, and we had to help them in terms of making sure that, that they didn't have to deal with vandalism and all of the things that happened with that. And that lasted for a while, and then it was okay. And when the Sikh temple was built, it was much the same. There were problems with the neighborhood not wanting them because they were so noticeable. And even their, their Gurdwara, the architecture was very Indian. And then they asked us, and we eventually did, we changed the name of the street that they were on to Gurdwara. This used to call Hillside Road. And because we are the only property on this road, the community asked the city council to rename it. People complained about it, and I, <laughs> I sat down and got out a map. I said, well, you know, we have Temple Street, we have uh, Church Street, we have, I can't remember now, but I found probably six streets that were, you know, related to that, to, to religion. There was some resistance. And some people, they said, oh, it's too hard to say Gurdwara Road. But nothing happened, and um, all the community is fine since then. We were happy that we have this Gurdwara. Because being, having a Gurdwara in Fremont, I believe it's, it's asset to the Fremont community. It kind of connects people. And in that context, we are able to, you know, start or implement very many programs from the Gurdwara, which was not, uh, which was not a tradition in India. As Fremont's new religious communities established places of worship, they also began to forge relationships and came together in new and innovative ways. We moved in in 1985. The countryside is so beautiful, so peaceful, this area, uh, because it's not developed yet. When we move in, uh, we just think that we will try the best to live peacefully with the neighbors. Uh, because like uh, our philosophy about uh, when we look at American society, uh, we know Amer uh, American society is a society that is open up for everyone if we are good enough. When we walk around, we have seen many churches. Those churches not just belong to the local American community, but also uh, belong to like a Korean community. So make us feel that uh, in this city should have many, many beliefs, uh, many, many people from dif dif different corners of the world. I remember opening up my parents' National Geographic and seeing pictures of Buddhist monks inside. It seemed very far away at that time, but I went to North Asia and I met my female mentor in monastic life there and came back to the United States. I came back to Wat Bhutanasorn, the Thai Buddhist temple that's only a mile and a half from here. And the abbot of that temple had been mentioning to me there are a good number of places for men in monastic life, but at that time there were none for women in this area. And these abbots wished that there were such an opportunity. In Thailand at that time, there were laws against this happening. In the United States, we have no such laws. This temple has been support uh, that uh, Vihara since the beginning. The people who run the center, uh, they're quite since they, they are very sincere to uh, offer Buddhism to all, so we, we try to support that. The type of coming together that we have just in general society is also happening in, in the Buddhist world here. All of the Buddhist traditions that we have now started with the Buddha and the monks walked to various countries. So we see, we see that kind of dispersal happening in the world, but here in this area we're coming back together. I think a lot of people had just assumed it would be two churches. No one ever envisioned that it would be a mosque coming in to bid. St. Paul was looking for a place to put a permanent facility, and I saw this property, and at the time, the city was going to sell it 
to do a, like a 7-Eleven type shopping center. The neighborhood across the way over there got really upset about that. And the city said to them, if you can figure out a way to build a park over there, because that's what the citizens wanted. They wanted a park. Um, if you can figure out how to do it without it costing the city anything, because we're not going to pay for the park, uh, then you go right ahead. So I called up the citizens group and said, would you consider letting the city sell part of the land for a church and use the proceeds from that to build the park? And the end result was that they offered two parcels so that the proceeds would, in fact, pay for the park. I think in 1985, we heard about this project. When I mean, it was yeah. going through, through the rezoning process, at that time, the practice was Muslim community will get together, they'll buy an old church or an old building, and they will call it Islamic Center, and they will have, you know, Friday prayer and, and convert that place into a mosque, which is not really look like a mosque. And it was a great desire of the community to have a real mosque in this area. The city is the one who set it up. They said, you will cooperate with one another. The city did not want two totally separate elements that could have friction. The mayor, city council members, the planning department, they were all working together, guiding us and helping us and how to you know, put this model together because it is a matter of pride for city of Fremont also. Peace Terrace is one of those interesting things in Fremont which typifies what the community is all about. They share parking uh, because the mosque is used more often on Friday and has more crowds on Friday. The church has its crowds on Sunday, so it seemed like a really good synergistic use of two different uh, religious uh, facilities. Our congregation, the biggest congregation, is on Fridays. And you will not see any car taking space from the church side. So our membership has a luxury of having the whole parking lot. And I think that's a very neighborly thing. There was one year on Ramadan, was, uh, and Christmas Eve coincided, and they were very uh, gracious, actually, about meeting somewhere else uh, that, that night uh, so we could be here for our Christmas Eve services. We swap newsletters once in a while, but it's more like having a good neighbor in a residential neighborhood where you know that if you go away for a weekend, you can, you can rely on them to feed your dog and pick up the newspaper and the mail and those sorts of things. And sometimes, you know, we take our neighbors for granted. So I guess that's another problem we have. You know, that. We can, oh, they are here, they are there. So it's not that important to communicate with them today. Maybe we can communicate with them tomorrow, and that tomorrow never comes. Uh, but sometimes if I want to see Reverend, I will go and see him. And I've done it so many times. We uh, have some things we're hearing in the news, for instance, about uh, what Muslims believe or are doing, or in their case, what Christians believe or are doing. It's nice to be able to walk across the street, basically. <laughs> Uh, symbolically and, and, and ask, is this really what, uh, what you think or what you believe? And sometimes there are some similarities and sometimes there's some real differences. And we want to hear those. We want to know what those are and not to kind of uh, skirt around those issues or to pretend that, you know, that, that we're the same or something. And we want to know what, how we're the same and how we're different. We coexist on a very friendly uh, terms and uh, I wish it can spread. The name Peace Terrace is a perfect name for this, for this place. And it's also a prayer that we might really not only know peace here, but to know it in our community and in our world and our families. So it's our prayer as well as our experience. From Peace Terrace to City Hall, Fremont is moving from mere diversity to true engagement. City government has played a positive role ever since I've been in Fremont. I think they've always uh, tried to make sure that uh, the various ethnic groups that are here 
uh, live here peacefully and that everybody is accepted. I feel like Fremont has been very welcoming. The first day that we walked through Old Town Niles for our traditional alms round, we weren't sure what the first day is going to be like. And suddenly, we heard screeching tires. This car pulls up. And then one of the ladies on the city council jumps out. And she says, I'm so glad to have caught you. <laughs> I really wanted to meet you on your first morning out and say congratulations. Yet amidst rapid change, the city has also faced real challenges. Fremont police are called to protect and serve while also navigating complex religious and cultural concerns. Our diversity is relatively new to the country you know, in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And so their customs and cultural norms are very strong. And you know we have to learn what those are. But you have to find a balance between respecting the cultural norms of somebody that's, that's come to the United States balanced with our culture. We were seeing a spike in reports of child abuse. The schools were reporting physical abuse to children. It was from one of our cultural groups and we met with them and you know their position was that's my property, I can treat my property like I want to treat my property and you can't tell me how I can treat my property or, or corporal punish my children. Yes we can. <laughs> But it's important that we understand the cultural differences. You know, we violated the temple by going in with our shoes on. And I did meet with all the members of our community that have a religious or cultural norm of taking your shoes off. That included the imams at the mosque, the priests at the Gurdwara, the leaders of the Hindu temple and the Thai Buddhist temple. And I said, look, if an officer's there on a routine call, then how do we get them inside if they need to go inside? I mean, we can ask them to take their shoes off, and some will, some don't have a problem with it. Others, we decided to buy surgical booties and they put them over their boots so we're not tracking dirt into a house of worship. But all of the leaders agreed, because the way I put it to them was, if you're in the temple and you're having a heart attack, you want us to stop, take our shoes off, you want us to come in. And to the person, come on in. Because there are exceptions in every religion to emergencies. I think if any police chief is gonna have this kind of diversity or seeing this diversity starting to develop, they need to get ahead of the curve. They need to train their people up on it bring in the experts, use community members, and understand that culture. We have a whole host of cultural institutions and organizations that play an active part in defining the city. And so we take all of that into account and um, have been doing a fairly consistent job of reaching out to these communities and involving them in the process we define our policies. Okay. Our employees are as diversified as the city is, and that was on purpose. We work to go into the uh, communities and recruited all um, public employees. Serving on the Fremont Planning Commission, we make decisions about homes, we make decisions about zoning, we make decisions about religious institutions. Uh, there have been a number of religious institutions over the years that have been approved. And I would always like to think of myself as a planning commissioner serving the interest of all of Fremont. Um, I happen to be from India. I happen to be a Hindu. But I happen to be a resident of Fremont, first and foremost. Any discussion? No? Uh, I just had one thing. Uh, the nonprofits of Fremont. Fremont residents of all faiths play leadership roles in the city, from the city council to the various commissions and boards. The Human Relations Commission, with Jewish and Muslim co-chairs, is called upon to promote unity, to coordinate human services, and to respond to hate violence. No, I'm doing the same project, so. The commission focuses on the diversity of our community and the both positive and negative things that happen when you bring people from different cultures together. Our Human Relations Commission has sponsored Unity Days and just all kinds of things to try to bring uh, people together. We try to create opportunities for people to 
to meet each other in, in you know, non-threatening ways where they can simply just, you know, maybe learn to appreciate someone else. We have a Festival of India parade in which, you know, it, the, the whole community is invited. When it started, uh, all you would see there would be Indian people. But each year you see more and more of a mixture. Yet some attempts at cultivating unity have created controversy. When City Council member Steve Cho and the Human Relations Commission proposed including the flags of other nations in the 4th of July parade, many citizens angrily protested. I've been involved with the July 4th parade since its inception in Fremont. And over the years, I was kind of disappointed at the turnout. And so I thought perhaps because of our diversity and, and the people who really do not know what July 4th means to people in this country. In order to engage them to understand the significance of July 4th, why don't we invite them to participate in some way? We did um, flags around the world um, entry, and some people were very upset with that because they were saying that, you know, this is our country and this is our 4th of July and we should not bring other flags. It really polarized the community because there were Many people in, in this community that felt that, um, that on July 4th, it's strictly red, white, and blue. There were a number of articles directed at me. The one phrase that, that, that I won't forget is um, that I should go home. Take your flags and go home. Well, where is home to me? Home to me is Los Angeles. <laughs> That's where I was born and raised. Yes, it did create a lot of controversy, but I think in the long run, it was much to do about nothing because the end result was to try to get more people involved and more people to, uh, to come and watch the parade, and it did achieve that purpose. And depression and falling. What about depression? What, what service did But you the problem of integration goes deeper than just increasing attendance at the 4th of July parade. The Human Relations Commission found that one of the most isolated populations in Fremont was foreign-born senior citizens. The City of Fremont Human Services Department wanted to find ways to um, better serve ethnic and faith communities. Is this a peer counseling senior or is this a senior who needs something more? With um, the changing demographics, um, there are a lot of challenges. The Family Resource Center opened about eight or nine years ago. It's really important to work with our different faith-based organizations to identify leadership, to find out what their interests are in serving their older adults, and then allow them to create opportunities in their own communities to support their own elders. There are so many people who lose their identity. I was this, I was officer, people who used to talk to me like this. But when they come here, they find it everything different because they are depending on other people. Language barrier is the most challenge to all the new immigrants. Isolation is pro probably one of the biggest problems. Those who are coming like students or youngers, they can, they can resolve these things easily because of their mobility. They will learn the language easily while at the senior age. It's not easy for them to do that. The um, Afghan community actually had a need for a laptop computer, and the Taiwanese community um, saw that they needed that, so they actually gifted the computer to them. They may have never met each other if it weren't for some of these programs that we're developing, but they're actually coming together, learning from one another. When I heard the Taiwanese community talk about their things, I felt that they are from the same place that I'm coming from. I mean, they are so much close to us, and even the Presbyterian Church. I mean, like, mental health issues being a taboo. They said it's a taboo in their community as well. So there is a lot of similarities, and that brings you together. You, you don't fee see people as different. But not everyone in Fremont takes the time to engage with their neighbors. And the city does grapple with hate-related violence. It is an issue the Human Relations Commission works to address 
Fremont has taken that stance of, of creating a human relations commission which deals with some of these issues, who work with the community, have forums to deal with issues such as hate crimes in schools, hate crimes in the city. In 1997 there was an incident at the main library here in Fremont where a, a, an African-American sixth grader went to do a project and he pulled out a book on Martin Luther King Jr. and found it was full of uh, racist graffiti. That was followed by a community-wide march that brought together various aspects of the community. I think that was really the first time that we formed a coalition. The next incident was the graffiti attack at Temple Beth Torah. In January of 2000, there was a very virulent anti-Semitic and racist attacks, there was death to Jews, six million wasn't enough, things like that. That night, we had our normal Hebrew school um, kids and um, one, of the, one of the teenagers, I can't even recall who it was, one of the teenagers uh, said, um, somebody wants to kill me and they don't even know me. Several years ago, the temple uh, was, uh, there was some graffiti that was uh, swastikas that were drawn on the temple. And that's when the commission came together and they held um, a, an event at the temple. They invited, you know, all different faith communities and uh, basically the community came together because they felt mm -hmm. that this is something that we would not tolerate in our community. After 9-11, Fremont was challenged in new ways. The events post 9-11 that happened in the rest of the countries were reflected in Fremont as well in the weeks right after the incident happened. The Afghani population here was attacked. Some of their storefront windows were um, broken. The mosques were targets of some uh, racial uh, issues. Since 9-11, we realized that people do not know who we are, and they all the time, all they hear is the negative stuff that they need read in the papers, on the media, about Muslims doing this and that. So it's, our t it's time that we go out and reach out to the, our non-Muslim friends and teach them about ourselves. The Sikh community, again, was uh, because of their turbans and because of the beards that they have, were identified as being part of the Taliban group, which is simply not the case. I wanted to give the message to the main community that uh, don't look at us <laughs> like a strange or, you know, like we have done something wrong. So to educate the mainstream community, we celebrate uh, Turban Day. We invited the police chief, some senators, community representatives uh, to educate them, give them some, you know, uh, Turbans 101 <laughs> course, uh, you know, let them know what is the history behind it, why we have turbans or, or what is the meaning. So when they kind of, you know, walk into your shoes, they put the turban on, they will never forget the experience. But looking back at 9-11, I would think that as tragic as it was, many of the other non-traditional religion began to open their doors. What these communities did was very positive. They took this head on and told the rest of the world, listen, we are part of this community. We want to live in harmony like the rest of you. We detest what the terrorists did. We are not any way associated with that. And they had forums, they had peace talks, they had open houses, invited people to their homes. And um, I think that did a lot to heal the whole uh, hurt that the community was going through. At the same time, an ecumenical group of Fremont churches came together to create a new bridge-building ministry. It would be based out of the Centerville Presbyterian Church, located close to the heart of Little Kabul. I've been working now in this bridge-building ministry over four years. It started right after 9-11. I had Muslim friends calling me and, and they were struggling with this too and I wanted to interact with them and help the churches understand the angst and struggle that Muslims were going through here in America. Your priorities is that when God tells you to do something, you do it right then. So The Muslims actually were being more, more open and encompassing and inviting the community and uh, which was an encouraging sign. And so... I was 
trying to get the, the churches involved with the Muslims. That's still what I'm trying to do and, uh, and fight against this tendency towards uh, polarizing and, and becoming adversarial. It's better to talk peacefully with no fighting. The basic teaching of Jesus was to, to love our Lord God as number one and right alongside is to love our neighbor as ourselves. For neighbors on Peace Terrace who had lived side by side for more than a decade, 9-11 offered a reminder that proximity was not sufficient. In a time of crisis, the communities would come together in new ways. Right after the 9-11, I, I, I remember that our neighbors came to us that if, uh, to provide us comfort that if they need, we need anything. And, and that is because they know that, you know, we, as I am a U.S. citizen uh, from this community, uh, have nothing to do with 9-11. After 9-11, I remember we had a special gathering uh, together. I think uh, there was uh, a greater um, desire to just meet together, just have some more informal kind of time together. Members of six or seven church groups uh, came to our uh, courtyard and we had a meeting, or not a meeting, a get together. And there were around 400 people from different churches and groups came and showed their support you know, for the Muslim community of this ISEV. The world climate that we live in, uh, being able to be good neighbors is really an important witness. The experience of living here is both challenging and rewarding. Uh, challenging in the fact of um, having to um, really sometimes go outside our comfort zone to be able to connect with people and and it's uh, it takes it takes some discipline actually to stay open uh, to people to really make the effort to understand uh, somebody else before uh, critiquing or judging them. I think God wanted us to bring together two different groups an example for other community here's a church here's a mosque and it's a beautiful concept. It seems like a simple thing to us in many ways that we live side by side and we get along in this way, but it's not so simple against the backdrop, I think, of the world scene. My greatest hope would be that, uh, well, frankly, that, that the world would see that Christians and Muslims can, uh, can coexist together, that there can be uh, mutual respect and understanding, that we can be uh, very open about our differences as well and very open about um, our what we believe and what we stand for, uh, but at the same time be able to, um, to be good neighbors together. Beyond Peace Terrace, new religious neighbors have reached out to those in need. Such acts are an expression of their faith. For minority faiths, they also serve as a means to educate the wider community. The saying that if your neighbor is hungry, you cannot eat you have to first make sure that your neighbor has food on their table. Charity is something that's mandatory in Islam. Two and a half percent of your wealth you have to give to the poor across the board. Muslims believe that we have to share our wealth and our time with the people that are living around us. That's the tradition of Sikh religion and to, to feed the poor people. Gives a sense of uh, satisfaction when we go out and feed to the homeless uh, or you know, we distribute the blankets to the um, homeless people in San Francisco. It was our 10th year and we've been recognized uh, for that effort because we had, I think, uh, thousands of blankets. There's no greater uh, cause than giving back to the community or giving it to and helping build a better community. When we've done free health camps, uh, it's because the doctors are coming in and they're willing to give back their time and service for those that are underinsured. Underinsured is not merely a Indian or a Hindu issue. Uninsured is an issue that confronts our entire communities. I mean, I think all religions teach these things, whether it be Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, every religion teaches good stuff. But sadly enough, our religion has been hijacked and that's why we are on the defensive all the time. Once a month, the Islamic Society of East Bay we cook during the day at home or we get it catered and we just bring it here and serve it. We are enjoying the fruit, everybody, all the immigrants. So we need to do our share also. It's a kind of works both ways. 
helping the people out and also you know spreading the message that who we are But despite a range of outreach efforts and bridge building in the years after 9-11, minority religious communities in Fremont would still face bias and backlash. In 2004, Muhammad Rajabali, who had participated in the rally at Temple Beth Torah, had some data showing that since 9-11 that the Muslim community was under pressure. There had been many hate incidents and hate crimes perpetrated against Muslims in this area. Jack Weinstein and I decided that it would be appropriate to have an anti-hate forum. It turns out that the Sikh community as well as the Muslim community were under great pressure, uh, kids getting beat up in school and things like that. The 2005 forum was sharply focused on the effects of 9-11 on the Muslim community, the Sikh community. Tonight is going to be a night of personal testimonies. And those testimonies should serve to remind us that we can learn from our neighbors. I'm going to ask the Irvington High School students to come up on the stage and have a seat here. I am Afghan and Muslim, but I'm also a citizen of the United States. I am a Muslim and an Afghan and an American. I was the only Sikh child with a turban on my head. I was often harassed and bothered. Some would fidget with my turban, while others would aim vulgar slurs at me. My best friend from second grade all the way up through ninth grade called me up after the incident on 9-11 and told me that because of his parents' restrictions, he wouldn't be allowed to see me for an unknown period of time until he could convince them that not all Muslims were terrorists. At this time in our country's history, I feel more vulnerable than before and more identifiable. And maybe it's important for you to know how I feel. Maybe simply it's important for a better understanding. Ask yourself this question. What does it mean to me when I hear one of my neighbors and one of my fellow community members make these statements and tell these stories? And to ask you to deeply think about what you can do to make sure our communities are places where everyone feels like they truly belong. Thank you for those eloquent statements. Thank you for hearing them. The forum challenged Fremont as a community to stand together against hate and to hear the concerns of their neighbors. Within this diverse community, building understanding and belonging would be an ongoing task. In the year of the city's 50th anniversary, citizens gathered together for Hands Around the Lake, affirming their identity as a city. There on the shores of Lake Elizabeth, many in Fremont celebrated unity amidst diversity. Yet on that same site, just weeks later, Fremont citizens would gather for mourning and for solemn remembrance. This city, which had been tested before, would now be touched by tragedy. Everyone was shocked because they thought they were in a better place. They didn't think they were going to be in Afghanistan and something like this would happen to our sister. The reason why we moved from Afghanistan was for protection. I've got a phone call from my sister-in-law. When I got to Fremont, I noticed there was like a lot of cops around. So I tried to go closer, but they wouldn't let me go. And that's when I heard from my aunt. She said that my sister was shot and murdered. Ali Ansari was walking to uh, school with her uh, youngest child in her hand to go pick up two of her other six children. And, um, and, and you know, just this man walked up and murdered her in broad daylight, and it was, it was a shock. I was in law enforcement for 40 years, and I never saw anything as tragic as that, you know, that poor little girl uh, sitting there watching her mother die. 
We do not have a motive at this time. But Homayo Ansari believes his sister was wearing the motive. She's Muslim. She wears hijab. Maybe that's why some crazy people didn't like it and they should. That's the reason why they probably shot her. The police soon identified a person of interest, a Fremont resident with a long criminal record and the words, no remorse, tattooed on his forehead. But the motive for the killing was not known. After the homicide, um, some of the community members who were the job were concerned, would they be targeted? And what we tried to point out, based on what we knew, this was had nothing to do with, this was not a cultural crime, this was not a hate crime. This was a purely a random act. We have a person in custody. When I found out that she was shot in the mouth, like at close range, and the child's with her, so kind of figured out that it, to me it was a hit crime. My nine-year-old, actually she's 10 years now, and she's afraid. She thinks that if she starts wearing the hijab, she will be killed because Ali Ansari was killed. And kind of um, opened my eyes and my thought process that, uh, you know, if somebody can do that to Ali Ansari, they can do that to me also. The underlying cause of it is not really known. However, it had the effect of a hate crime. That is, it terrorized um, the entire community, and terrorized certainly the Muslim community, uh, because the immediate assumption is that the, 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 the only reason that, that Mrs. Ansari was killed is because she was wearing a hijab and was easily recognized as a Muslim woman. Amidst shock, Fear and grief. Many in Fremont wondered how to respond. When the graffiti appeared, and these tigers were evidently young, um, emotive Afghans who wanted to make a statement. And here at the church, they did her name, Alia Ansari, in, in three foot high letters, R.I.P. And the church just kind of as a grassroots response, some little old ladies decided to uh, put up a wreath instead of, oh, just paint it over. They wanted to identify with the, with the angst and the agony of the Afghan community. And there it stood, and these two guys drive up, and they were dressed very nicely. It was the first day of the Eid. And so I, I greeted them. They introduced themselves from the Islamic Center of the East Bay. And they came, having heard about the graffiti, to offer to remove it. It was a very nice gesture, and I thanked them for that. And I also then explained about the wreath. We just put the wreath up there. It was, uh, I call these moments kind of divine uh, appointments. And there, there it was, um, and we talked about the principle of returning a blessing for the curse. The city responded by reaching out to the family and to the Muslim community. I visited the family the next day. We held a memorial in, our, in Central Park. And we tried to do, you know, whatever we could. On Friday, they did the Muslim prayer at the park with the blessing of the city officials. That allowed her casket to be brought onto the public park property, which is usually not allowed. And it was a traditional Muslim prayer. It was a very peaceful day. It felt pretty good. The next day, a second memorial service was held at the Centerville Presbyterian Church. I offered the church gymnasium as a place to host a community memorial service. We are the neighborhood church, and this is a tragedy that, that impacts us all. Ahmed shows up with all six children. It was just a wonderful moment where everyone just spontaneously rose to their feet and, uh, and acknowledged them. And two grandmothers came with them, and, and those six children that's when my heart was really touched for them. One of her brothers, also Ali, is one of her brothers spoke. Uh, we arrived in this country with the family in 1986 uh, as refugees from the war in Afghanistan. And um, we were introduced to this society 
and uh, we, we we tried to manage as best as we could. Alia, she was like our mother. She helped raise us. She helped her neighbors, and she helped us all. And, Really without words. God rest your soul. Aya wanted to live and raise her children and be proud of them. But this tragic incident cut her life very short. Her family wants nothing but the community to pray for her to rest in peace and for the children to be safe. We pray that we are able to continue the legacy of the wonderful woman whose passing, tragic passing, has brought us together, that we're able to stay together, to make a better world for her children and for all of the children. It's shaken people, some it's dismayed, uh, so they say this isn't the Fremont that I know and love. Um, but others have said, no, maybe we've been asleep and we need to get connected at a deeper level so that this sort of thing doesn't happen. So I think it's been a call to action and a call to alarm. A few days after the church memorial service, Aliyah's husband and six children left Fremont for Afghanistan. Alia Ansari was laid to rest in a graveyard in Mazari Sharif. Her children returned to the country their mother had fled 20 years earlier. Ahmed thought that the best thing for these children was to take them back to their homeland in Afghanistan, to Mazari Sharif, where he had family to help him. They were all born in the United States. It's pretty new for them. It's probably a different environment also raised here and then it's like going back 30, 40 years behind, so it's kind of hard, but. Happy, I can't be happy uh, because my kids are not in a state of happiness, so I cannot be happy. And I work for one day at a time. After the Ansari family had moved to Afghanistan, one final remembrance was held. On a rainy day in a Fremont park, citizens came together to honor the memory of Aliyah Ansari and to heal as a community. One of the things that we were all struggling with after the murder of Aliyah Ansari is uh, how we show support not just to the family but to the community at large and to all of the different minority communities that live in Fremont. And we just came up with the idea of doing something really simple like wearing a hijab or a turban and showing people that clothing is absolutely not a factor into deciding who the individual is. It goes much beyond that. Because of religion, we cannot be separated. The main thing is, we are part of this society. Hijab, turban, cap should be respected. One, two, three. It is just really touching to me to see all of these women who are American, you know, whether they're Jewish or Hindu, or Catholic, they said, we are going to stand up for a community member in whatever way they could demonstrate. As the Ansari family adjusted to life in Afghanistan, they received a visitor. Bruce Green traveled to Mazari Sharif to let the family know they were remembered by their friends and by their neighbors in Fremont. The man accused in Aliyah Ansari's murder was tried and convicted. He was not charged with a hate crime. Now that the trial is over and the killer is behind bars, Ahmad Ansari is considering bringing his children home to Fremont. Fremont faces real challenges as a diverse and growing city. 
as it grapples with change, responds to crisis, and comes together across lines of difference. It's easy to have the uh, idea uh, in our minds of, of living together and coexisting together with different backgrounds and whatnot, uh, but then there's a the daily doing of it. I think it is the openness of the people uh, of this area and the city and council member and the mayor, I think that has played a very, very positive role. And American Muslims are a very important part of the city of Fremont now. I think a lot of things in Fremont have worked uh, because of the proactive stances that these communities, the smaller communities have taken in being part of the mainstream community. There's a sense of volunteerism and getting involved in the community that I haven't seen any place else in a city this large. When you engage and you reach and you accommodate, something productive will always come out at the end. And it's a winning model. Now over the years, I think it's become such a pattern in, in the DNA of of the communities that it comes so naturally. In the decades since its founding, the city has grown and diversified in ways its founders could never have anticipated. Three months is a very uh, good example uh, to uh, make the people Think that we can live peacefully together. We may uh, come from the different belief, uh, from different corners of the world, but we live peacefully. These great religions teach about love and brotherhood, and loving kindness, and how to how to live well with one another. And we we should be able to do that. Fremont probably is representative of what neighborhoods are going to become. 10, 20, 30 years down the line. We are just at the forefront of what's going to happen to many urban communities in, in America. Looking forward to the next 50 years, what does the future hold for Fremont? I would love to see the city of Fremont in 50 years as, as a, a prime example of the blessing of pluralism to respect the differences and the contributions of, of each group. Obviously we'll have more people and it'll probably be more congested and all of the difficulties one has with, with inter-ethnic conflicts perhaps will, you know, will still be there. I think there'll still be a need for anti-hate forums. To see what the future is, is, will be like, you, you need to look at the high schools because even though the immigrant parents will tend to stick together, if you go look at the kids, they just they play with each other, they get along with each other. We should not stay in our shell or our comfort zone. We're not going to go back anymore. <laughs> you know, our kids are not going to go back, so we need to invest in this system and participate. and. Uh, you know, bring our focus to the issues uh, happening uh, here locally or, you know, in the American system. And I am very hopeful that uh, our next generation, generation, we will be able to contribute more. My hopes for the city of Fremont, uh, the next 50 years, I think, uh, is for the, the city to continue to be a, a place of, uh, of opportunity for, for all people, uh, whatever their backgrounds. I think Fremont has so much to offer in some sense of, of how we move forward in this uh, increasingly shrinking world and, and how we uh, can respect one another but also um, be able to share who we are with integrity. Through civic leadership and interfaith action, strangers have become neighbors in this American city. Oh, oh, oh.